the board made a decision this past week that on the last Sunday of each month we're going to receive a benevolent offering. Something that you would designate benevolent offering. If you do it online, you can, uh, I think under the notes section, you can write benevolent offering there. Uh, as the COVID situation continues, we're becoming aware of more and more people who have uh, practical needs that we can try and meet uh, and help assist them with the love of Christ to join that. So uh, at the end of every month, we're going to receive a benevolent offering. So next week we'll be doing that, but just to let you know, that's what it's about. It's a, it's a new thing that we've uh, implemented now to start at the end of next week. Today, as you noticed when you came in, I hope you all received the uh, commun communion elements, the cup and the wafer that are together. If you didn't, you can go out in the foyer again and foyer again and uh, get them there. But we will be receiving communion. And to those of you who are online, if you could just prepare uh, a, a drink and, and a wafer or, or a piece of bread for a communion, which we were going to serve after our first set of songs. So if you could do that. But before we're called to worship, Let's remember, th this is the day that the Lord has given to us, and we will what? Rejoice. We will rejoice in it. So let's join our hearts in prayer as we prepare to rejoice in the Lord. Father, we come to you with thanksgiving. You've given us beautiful sunshine outside and beautiful weather. Our temperatures are a little cooler, but a lot of us kind of like that uh, better. But Father, we take this day as a gift from you, and we rejoice with you and bring praise to your name. May you be honored. May you be pleased with our sacrifice and our offering of praise that we offer this morning. Because we do it not for ourselves, we do it for you. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. I'm going to stand and uh, keep those masks on as we go to sing the worship of the Lord together. Jesus. 
Jesus Messiah. Name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah.
angel of death didn't win those homes and said, well, who here is worthy? Who here deserves to be passed over? Who here deserves to be saved? The angel of death passed over that home because it was covered. We need to remember that as we come to Jesus Christ and the payment that He has made, we're passed over that punishment. His blood covers our sin as we come to Him. So that's what we celebrate this morning. Let's just start our hearts in prayer. Father, I, I don't think we can often um, fully comprehend the magnitude of what the blood of Jesus covers, what His body is, the offering His body covers. But Lord, you know it all, and you've done it all for us. So as we come now and, uh, in remembrance, take this meal. Yes, we do so in one way somberly because of what it represented, the death, the shedding of the blood of Jesus, but also not just somber, in celebration because of what it meant with the death and the, the shedding of the blood of Jesus, what it meant for us, that we could be in restored relationship with you, and not just restore a relationship until the next offering is made, but restore a relationship forever for eternity, Father. Because it was once for all that Christ died. All people, all time, all sins. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this gift of Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Amen. I would invite you to take the top that you have received. And if you take the, the very top piece of uh, cellophane off, you're going to find there's access to a wafer there. Thank you. 
then sings my soul, my Savior God, to Thee. Sister Doreen and her husband Paul. So good to have you here this morning. So thank you for joining us. Welcome. <laughs> and just to remind you, uh, please don't socialize with them in the building here. But we do go <laughs> For the past two messages in this series through the books of First and Second Peter, uh, we have taken the, the uh, taken us through those books. We know that. First, we noted two things in particular in the past two messages. One is that we need to be growing spiritually. We need to be growing in our faith. And the second is we noted, we noted that the importance of Scripture, the importance that the Bible has to have in our lives. And why those two things were brought up in Second Peter here is because now as we transition into uh, chapter 2, Peter's going to talk about the, the meat of the matter kind of thing, of what really matters. And here's why I really wrote to you. And it's to deal with false prophets or false teachers that had come in their midst that they had. In 1 Peter chapter 1, toward the end there, in verse 19, it says, We have also the prophetic message is something completely reliable. So he referred to that prophetic message. And then as I highlighted to his last week, when we hear that phrase, prophetic message, we know that what it means is what we would know as the Old Testament scriptures now, or at least a portion of, of the Old Testament scriptures that we have there. And then in verse 20, it says that no prophecy of scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. So he's, he's setting the, the, the foundation of where scripture comes from and the importance, importance of scripture that we have for us. But Peter is talking about prophets and, and the importance of their ministry that, that he has there. But as we come to chapter 2, he says here, there were also pro false prophets among the people. Now, what he's referring to, he's going back to the Old Testament days, he says there were false prophets and among the people, meaning the Old Testament people there, when he looks at that. So he says that's, they had false prophets back then. But then he goes on and he says with that, in, in, later in that, the beginning of, the of chapter 2, he says, just as there will be false teachers among you. So there was false teachers, false prophets back then, and there's false teachers, false prophets. Now, when we see these phrases that's used here, uh, teachers and prophets, it's it being used interchangeably uh, with, with them to do that. I want to talk to us this morning about false teachers, about false prophets. But before we do, I think what it would be good to do is uh, set down a, a definition of what we call that teacher or the prophet and what their responsibility was. And I would, I would put it this way. The primary role of the prophet and teacher was and still is in the church today. Not prediction, but it was in confronting both believers and non-believers alike with the truth of God in a way that brought about a response. So the, the, the prophet, the teacher, was challenged with confronting people with the truth of God in a, about sin and, and the wrongs we were doing in a way that was confronting them to change, to do that. Prophets and teachers were ones who, who pled God's plea in hope of response. 
looking for a response in that. Uh, technically, what I'm doing now, I do every Sunday when we when we teach, we, we say this. It's a form of prophecy. It's a form of teaching that goes out. The responsibility of doing that to do that. Prophecy in a biblical sense is not so much foretelling the future events, but foretelling the present. Not foretelling the future events. That was a part of prophecy, where they say, well, this, this has been revealed to me, this is going to happen. But the primary purpose of prophecy is this, this is what's happening now. Uh, even when we go to the Old Testament, we can find some prophecy that says, here's what's going to happen in the future. But a lot of it looked at, here's what you're doing now, and here's how it wanders from God's standards. So that, that's what they were looking at as you saw that there. It was a kind of a, thus says the Lord, or thus say, uh, saith the Lord, if we want to use the old King James language, thus saith the Lord, uh, is what the prophet was responsible for doing. The prophets were more proclaimers than they were predictors. They proclaimed the word of God. They didn't always predict, predict in the future. Sometimes I think now that when we think of the word prophets, we think, oh, there are people that says, well, this is what's going to happen in the future. This is what's going to happen in the future. And that was a part of it. But a primary part of it, the majority of it was, here's what's happening now. And here's how it compares to the standard of God, whether it's lining up with the standard of God or not lining up with the standard of God. So with that understanding, let's come to our text this morning at the beginning of chapter 2. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to read the first three verses of chapter 2. And then from there, we're going to go and we're going to look at uh, some other portions of chapter 2 and some other places in the Bible as well. But listen as I read from the word of God. But there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the, the sovereign Lord who, who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow the depraved conduct and will bring the, the way of truth into dis dispute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Their condemnation ha has been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. This is the word of God. So what I want to do with this, with our, not just with this portion of the text, but other places in this first chapter this morning, is I want to look at three aspects of the false teacher, of the false prophet uh, that we have here. First of all, I want us to look at the faults or the failures of the false teachers. Then I want us to look at the followers or the fans of the false teachers. And then to conclude, I want us to look at the fall or the future of false teachers. So first we begin with the, the faults or the failures of the false teachers. And right in the beginning in verse 1, it says there that they, they will secretly induce, introduce destructive her, uh, heresies. So in other words, they have an agenda. False teachers, they have an agenda. They're secretly introducing these, these false heresies that they have with them. It says there that they do it secretly. It's not like they're going to come into an, an environment like a church like this and spread something that's so far out that you're going to notice it right away. What they're going to do is go a little bit off center, and then a bit more, and then a bit more. But I'm not so much as concerned of uh, most of the time of what's happening within a church. And in in, when, I, when I say a church, I mean a, a local congregation like us in here, like that. But it's what we have available to us through the media. Uh, what's available on there online? What's available on television? I, I thought of what we hear on radio. Does anybody even listen to a radio anymore? Okay, a few people listen to a radio. I just, it seems like years since I've listened to a radio to do that. Uh, but you do that. What we have out there in electronic media especially can expose us to the, the, the teachings of the false teachers. And the trouble is, it's secretly done. It's done with, with the, like I said, just going a bit off center, and it sounds right, and a bit off center, and it sounds right, and then further and further, the next thing you know, uh, we're far away, till, till eventually, as it says there, and the, there will be false teachers among you, they will secretly introduce destructive heresies. They're destructive. They're not only secretive with an agenda, they're destructive. One of their faults is that they are destructive. Uh, in particular, the heresy that these people had been facing in Second Peter, was some of the false teachers were teaching, well, Jesus hasn't come back yet. Obviously, he's not going to come back yet. Do you ever read some of the predict not predictions, but some of the prophecies, some of the, the, the scripture that relates to the return of Jesus? And you kind of wonder, like, when's it going to happen? Like, that was written from the New Testament perspective. 
uh, about 2,000 years ago, and we could say, well, when's that going to happen? Well, here they are probably 60, or, sorry, 30 or 35 years later, from 60 to 65 AD, so 30 to 35 years after Jesus was here, and they said, not here yet. Uh, I introduced my friend here, Warren. 50 something years we've known each other. Lord have mercy. I don't know if you should have mercy on you or mercy on me or mercy on our families. It seems like a long time. Think back in your own life. What, were you, what was happening in your life 30 years ago? 30 years ago. I remember I was at a couple's 25th wedding anniversary and I, when I was about 18 and 19 and I thought, man, are they ever old? <laughs> and now I look at the thing, it, it seems, we and I are at 39 years, 39 years, yeah, 39 Right, dear? Yeah. <laughs> She's outside putting her thumb up. Yeah. <laughs> 39 years. We're at 30, and then we look at these people. That's, wow, that's a long time, but it went by so quickly, too. So here's these people saying, Jesus, we were expecting him to come, like at any moment, and he's not come. So some of the false teachers were saying, see, he, he was going to come, but obviously he didn't, so obviously he's not. So what's that mean? Live like you want to live. And they were living in destructive ways. They were living in destructive ways to follow that through. What are some of the heresies that we can face today? I think one of the heresies we can face today is a work salvation. You can earn your way into God's favor. Because we're supposed to work out our salvation, yes, but you can twist that and eventually it becomes how much favor do we have with God? How have we worked that out? That can be a particular uh, uh, hazard for us in a, with the beliefs of a holiness movement. Because we equate the, the, the works that we do out of an expression of love and appreciation for God, the works that we do, we can equate that, or te can tend to equate that with earning God's favor. Earning God's favor. Uh, there's also the, the, the opposite side of that coin that says, well, God is love. Everybody gets in. Everybody gets in and they, they, they buy into that one. There's a lack of judgment by God, which is thereby denying his sovereignty to do that. Uh, there's also a denial of the divinity of Christ uh, in some denominations now where Christ was just simply a good moral teacher. Uh, there's a downplaying of the, the, the inerrancy and the, the, uh, the, the, uh, of, of scripture, inerrancy of scripture and what scripture is. The, the, some people would, would promote it. Well, it's just a bunch of illustrative stories. Those things didn't really happen. They're just spiritual illustrations for us to do that. Those are the sorts of heresies that we can begin to buy in, the sorts of things that we can follow after. In verse 3, it says about another fault of the prophets and false teachers is their greed, the greed of these teachers. If you look at verse 14, verse 14, it goes on to say there, with eyes full of adultery, they never stop singing. They seduce the unstable. They are experts in greed. Experts in greed. Now, we could look at that, and as I think of greed, how do we normally think of greed, and what do we equate with it? Money, right. And we think of greed, we think in a monetary sense, but this isn't necessarily greed in a monetary sense. This would be a greed in, in power and attention and fame that they're working at. And when we look at many of the cult leaders that have come, even in recent history, many of them, it's not been for the money aspect of it. It's been because... They, 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 they look at it and say, well, look how high I'm being exalted. Look how, how, how esteemed I'm being with this. And they do that so that they, they have greed for, for, for that. Verse 3 is also says they are exploiting. And their greed, these teachers will exploit with fabricated stories. They'll f exploit. They'll take advantage of others. Uh, we see this particularly with, uh, how many of you remember the, the Jim Jones cult of Jonestown? Yeah, we're all... Most of us, anyway, pretty old enough to remember that. How about the David Koresh of uh, Waco, Texas, uh, the Branch Davidian Waco, Texas? I call it Waco, Texas, because all sorts of crazy stuff happens down there. Uh, but yeah, when these people, they exploited people, they took advantage of individuals in what they promised them. We're going to see that in a minute about why they followed them. In verse 10, we look over in verse 10, halfway through it says, They are bold. And they are arrogant. Now I notice, uh, it's interesting how it says it here. They are bold and arrogant. They are not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings. Wow. That is bold and that is arrogant. When you're not afraid to heap abuse on celestial beings if they have them. They, they tend to be intimidators. When they're bold and arrogant, they tend to be intimidators. Uh, when, they, when someone uh, has a different view than theirs, they, they put them down. 
and they put them down bluntly. Uh, so we need to be careful of that. We see in verse 12, where it refers to them here as blasphemers. But these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. It means that they're denying God's power and God's majesty is what they're doing here. And now we can think of blasphemy as maybe something that's done with the mouth, but it wasn't necessarily limited to the words. It could be limited to the actions as well. Do your actions match what you're teaching? Or do your actions match what the scripture says? And if not, it can be blasphemy. And I think we need to be careful. And I don't want to throw a scare, scare tactic into us uh, by saying we need to be careful that if our actions don't match what the scripture says or our actions don't match what we're saying, then we need to be careful that we're falling into blasphemy. But that's what these false teachers were doing. Because what they were living out was very contrary to what they were teaching and what scripture said in there. Uh, we need to remember that. In, sec in 1 Timothy, it says the, the qualifications uh, of an elder, and one of them is able to teach. Now, able to teach doesn't mean you have the ability to stand in front of a group of people and uh, describe something in a clear manner. There's, that's a part of it. But a bigger part of being able to teach is this, that your lifestyle matches what you're teaching so that it can be believed. Your lifestyle is matching what you're teaching so that it can be believed. And that was one of the problems with these false teachers. What they were doing wasn't matching what they were teaching. And so it couldn't be believed in that. Now, I, I smile a bit at the end of that where it says, at the, at the end of uh, the first part of verse 12, but these, these people blaspheme in matters they do not understand. It amazes me the number of people I meet even today who have an opinion on what God does or doesn't do who have an opinion on what the Bible should or shouldn't say, and yet they very rarely take it themselves to what the Bible says. They very rarely come before God. And I'm not saying that negative against them in a sense, but so many people can, can say, well, God wouldn't do that. What makes you think God wouldn't do that? Is it because you don't want God to do that or you don't think God will do that because that's where your picture frame of theology is or belief is? No, we need to come to the scripture and say, what does it say? So these people here, they, they, they talk of uh, the, the blasphemers in matters they don't even understand doing it. Now we can look at those words and say, well, how foolish of them. But they can be foolish in it. But still people fall for it. Uh, even though they are false teachers, even though they are, they are false prophets and do have their faults, sadder still is there people who are following them. There are people who are fans of them. And what I want to do is take a, a couple of moments to look in the, the text that we have today and say, okay, why do people follow them? Why are people fans of these false teachers? What, what happens with that? We go back to verse 2 where it says there, many will follow their depraved conduct. Now, how many of us, put your hand up. We're going to take a survey here. How many of us, if you knew someone was carrying on with depraved conduct, would you follow them? No. But they get people to follow them. They get people to follow them. Well, we, when we look at that, how, do, how does that happen? Why, why are these false teachers there? Well, I'll go to verse 18. And it gives us part of the reason why. They are pe appealing to the lustly desi lu lustful desires of their flesh. So we could say, no, I wouldn't follow those people if they're like that. But when those people appeal to the, the lustful desires of the flesh, oh, that kind of sounds nice. That sounds like something I might be interested in. That sounds like something I might, I might want to follow, something I might want to do. And that's what they do. They follow you. It's, it says in verse 3, where they, ex they exploit you with fabricated stories. They make up stories to entice you, to make it appealing to you, to follow after you. Back to verse 18, where it says halfway through ver verse 18, um, they entice people who are just escaping from those who, who live in error. In other words, they target new believers. People who have recently come to the faith, they begin to target them. Because, they, as it says there, they're appealing to lots of desires. They entice people who are just escaping from, from those, who live in er those who live in error. So they come from those who live in error and they go after the new believers and something like that. Verse 19, they go after the freedom. They promise freedom. Many of the cults that we see, the, the Jonestown cult, the, the Branch Davidian cult, many of those people went into those cults because of the freedom that was promised to them. 
and just they, they, what did they receive? They received exactly the opposite, but the freedom that was promised to them. There's a, a 14th century duke named Reynold, Reynold III of Belgium, 14th century duke. He uh, had trouble controlling himself, especially his appetite, and his girth showed it. Well, he, one day, his, or one season, his, his brother Edward and him uh, came into this dispute with each other, and Edward ended up capturing Reynold. And rather than kill him, what he did was he built a room around Reynold with the windows and doors small enough that he couldn't get his body through it because he was so big. And then he said to his brother, I tell you what, when you lose enough weight to fit through a window or to fit through a door, you're free to go and you can have all your kingdom back and everything you had before, you can have it all back. Ten years later, Reynold was still in that room when, when uh, uh, Edward died. And he was in that room because Re Edward knew what to do. Every day, he would have a bundle of food delivered to him, delicious food. He knew that his brother couldn't resist the temptation to that food and he stayed in there. And he was in such bad shape that after he was broken out of the room when Edward died, he died himself within a year. You see, you promise freedom, but you're an enemy of your own appetites. You're an enemy of your own appetites. And that's what these false teachers do. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, I think we've got it coming on the wall here. We read, For time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they will suit their own desires. They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. We can be guilty of that in the church even. We want to hear the type of message we want to hear. Now, I, I don't mean to be condemning when I say this, but there's something I've noticed over 30 years of, of ministry, 30 years of preaching. Whenever I get the most comments at the end of a message, they say, that was a good sermon, Pastor, that was a good sermon. I would, I, not always, but I would often look at it and say, okay, when I think of the sermon, what was good about it? Often it was because it was a sermon about possibly the world out there instead of the body in here. And it was like, it left me alone. That was a good sermon. <laughs> it made me feel, feel spiritual. Now, if you want to tell me today's message was good, I'm not going <laughs> to... But yeah, if it leaves me alone, I feel good. I can feel like I've been inoculated with my, my religious dose, if you call it that. And that's what some people do in the church today. They look to be inoculated. They look to get their, their inoculation, that needle, to, to say, okay, you've got your fix. You've got what you need. And that's what happens to these people. And that's how come they end up following the false prophets. Because the false prophets are doing what? They're telling them what they want to hear. They're telling them what they want to hear. Are they getting what they want to hear? No, they're not getting it in the end. But they're telling them what they want to hear. I'll promise you freedom. I'll promise you this. I'll promise you that. And they, they never get it. I've said it before and I'll say it again. Don't believe something just because I say it. I stand up here on a Sunday morning. I open up the Word of God and I say, don't believe I, I, something just because I say it. I encourage people to open a Bible and to look and see what it says uh, for that reason of accountability. It's not that I think you're ignoring it, but for accountability's sake. Or read it afterwards or do something for accountability's sake. Say to yourself, does this really say it? And if you don't think it does, appropriately, I'm going to say, don't come and tell me right away I'm preaching heresy. At least wait two days. Uh, <laughs> but appropriately, we can discuss that and say, okay, here's where we get that from and, and walk it through. But be a student of the word yourself. Don't just take it because a preacher at the front spoon feeds you. One person I remember years ago said, we're like a bunch of spiritual pigs. We just want to be fed and fed and fed. And when we're fed, we roll over, belch, and fall asleep. It's not what we're supposed to do. Not what we're supposed to do. Well, finally, I want to look at the, the fall or the failure of false teachers. What's going to become of these false teachers? In verse 3, it says, Their condemnation has long been hanging over them, and their destruction has not been sleeping. So there is condemnation for them. There is destruction for them from the Lord. We go back down to verse 12 again, and we see in verse 12, it says, born only to be caught and destroyed like animals who will perish. These, these false teachers, these false prophets, 
They're born only to be caught and destroyed, like, like the animals that are going to be destroyed and do that. In verse 13, we see that they, they will be paid back with harm for the harm they have done. So there will be destruction for these false teachers, these false prophets. There is destruction coming in that. The one verse in the Bible that really sobers me up, that really, I think I've, I may have mentioned it before, but really uh, causes me to take a step back and say, be careful, Mark. Be careful. Is James chapter 3, verse 1, where it says, Not many of you should presume to be teachers of my fellow believers, because you know that we who teach will be judged more strictly. We need to take the word of God seriously. We need to take the word of God seriously to do that. False teachers could come to us from this very platform. False teachers could come to us in our Sunday school classes. But I think that's probably less likely than false teachers coming to us from, as I said at the beginning of the message, the outside, especially in the electronic media that we have today, the resources that we have today, everything that's available to us today, and probably even more so since COVID started than after that, because now, now we're all televangelists. They said over, overnight, every pastor turned into a televangelist in the middle of March, and every pastor's spouse turned into a production engineer with editing the videos to get it ready to do that. But yeah, there's such a proliferation of teaching that's available at the click of a mouse out there that could lead us in the wrong way. I read for you just a moment ago from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 talked about uh, we want to hear what our, our tickling ears desire. Well, in verses 1 and 2, we read this. In the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing and his kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Preach the word. Stay to the word and what the word says. Not what man says, but what the word says. Let's be people who are committed to the word of God. One of my responsibilities as an interim pastor, at the very end, they said, pass the baton. And they, they've encouraged us, my very last service will be your next pastor's very first service. And one of the things they encourage us to do is to actually get a literal baton, like in a, in, a, in a foot race that you pass a baton. Well, one thing that I will do different than that, instead of a baton, I will pass a Bible. Stay to the word of God in all that you do. Let's pray. Father, your word tells us that your word will not return void. So I pray, Lord, that we would be people of your word, that we would uh, hear your word, we would read your word, we would study your word, and we would be people who, who follow after your word, who live out your word. Lord, uh, guide us as a body and protect us. Pour a hedge and a dome of protection over and under and around us, Lord. Keep us from false teachers. Uh, especially protect us from, from the access of the, 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 the media that is out there, whether it be printed media, uh, television media, uh, electronic media like digital media that we get on the internet anything like that protect us Lord put checks in our spirit mm -hmm. to keep us away from that help us to be uh, bold enough to ask questions of others and not embarrassed by those questions if we would Father when we were questioning something let us not feel so, so dumb that well I'm not going to ask anyone they'll think I'm stupid well Father that's already been settled for most of us mm -hmm. but I pray that Father you would help us to be bold and to speak up and to ask those questions and Father, help us to build one another up. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand once more as we sing. Yeah.
his word. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with the gospel, the message I have proclaimed in Jesus, about Jesus Christ, to the only wise God, be glory forever through Jesus Christ. Amen. We are dismissed. Now we just invite us, if we could leave, starting on this side, at the back, and then when this side is finished, out the door, this side can start at the back here and go out. And remember, no socializing till you're outside.